You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Pete Warhurst. Pete is, is, is an interesting guest for me today and one I'm very excited to have. He is the founder and former CEO of Pods and the current CEO and founder of Red Rover Moving and Storage. Pete, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Pete. Thank you so much for taking the time. I, I'm, I'm going to just get right into this because you could be doing anything in the world right now. You sold your company that you started for a lot of money. I'll say by any standard, a lot of money. Hopefully you don't mind me saying that. But what? why are you still at this? <laughs> because I think anyone who, who hasn't had the level of success you've had wonders at like I do. You could be doing anything. I got asked that just yesterday again. I get, I get asked frequently and stuff. And, you know, I think it's the same reason my blood pressure is so high. My doctor says it's my personality, right? And uh, uh, I'm a type A and, uh, uh, you know, we, Pods was very successful. We did a lot of things right, um, but hindsight's 2020, and and there's a lot of things we could have done better. And, and uh, you know, that's really the what uh, drove me to start Red Rover and stuff. I, uh, I literally... Uh, went to, to Pods, um, the CEO, and offered to share the idea with him. And I was looking to make 5 or $10 a container every time they rented a container and stay retired. You know, that was my ambition, to stay retired. But um, uh, they, he said, you know, no thanks. And he wouldn't sign a non-compete, non-disclosure. And I waited another couple of months and called the uh, uh, one of the board members on Pods from the investment group that owned them at the time. And uh, and same pitch. I said, I, I have this idea. I think it'll add 50% to your top line with better margins at the bottom line. I said, sign a non-compete, non-disclosure. I'll tell you all about it if you want my help. And, and they wouldn't sign and stuff. And then so it's just too good an idea and too good a product for me not to have come out of retirement to do it again. So you're right. I didn't have to come out of retirement. I'm here. I'm enjoying myself. And um, we've got a lot of traction. Well, you've, you've been billed as a serial entrepreneur. Is that a fair assessment? Is that a fair well, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I started off, I was a firefighter paramedic and got involved with uh, putting the 911 systems in, in Pinellas County and, and ended up uh, starting a company with uh, the fire chief and the software engineer and, and myself. And we ended up uh, being the second largest 911 provider for police fire and EMS software in the nation. No kidding. Okay. And uh, we ended up selling that to... Uh, um, uh, Bell Atlantic, uh, which is now AT and T, uh, and and uh, I was at age forty and thought I retired. So that was one, and That's you know, of, of course, of pods. In the interim, I did a mini storage that I did pretty well with, and uh, I did a car wash uh, chain that I start started the chain that I did pretty well in. So, yeah, this I guess is my fifth venture, um, and all of them have been successful so far. So. If that's serial, that's me. It sounds pretty serial to me. And uh, well, now, now let, let's start a little further back, if you don't mind. I, I, I was listening to another podcast that you were on, and you and I have something in common where our first jobs uh, were both working at a gas station pumping gas, which which is a foreign concept today, of course. But, you know, my <laughs> kids, I don't think, believe me when I tell them that I stood out in the sun during the summer. I was 15. <laughs> I walked to the gas station that was close to my house, and I pumped gas and you know clean people's windshields all day and that was sounds like similar to your experience it, it absolutely was i uh i was still in high school when i had that job um and uh it was uh, a local gas station they had two locations and uh one of the, the pet peeves of the owners was to keep the pumps clean and and why always wash them down and and you know obviously greet the customer and, and, and be pleasant and so forth and uh, yeah, so that's where I started, and uh, uh, unfortunately, one day I was out cleaning the pumps and, and uh, heard a screech and, uh, uh, and a scream, and a, a young girl, I'm going to say she was five, six years old, got hit by a car. Oh, wow. And that's what drove me to, the, uh, to uh, becoming a firefighter and ultimately a paramedic. I was one of the first paramedics in the state of uh, Florida, but uh, yeah, that tragedy just, I... I I had no skills. I had no idea what to do. And um, all I did is I ran in. 911 wasn't around at those days. I dialed the seven digit number and the fire department came down. And I joined that fire department within six months or a year, or whatever it was. So, th so this incident that no, you know, no one could have seen coming, you know, out of the blue, really altered the path of your life just, just in that one, that one instant. Um, 
did it was it an immediate thing that you just couldn't couldn't shake or, or, or yeah yeah no doubt it was absolutely devastating you know to see something like that and uh not know what to do or how to how to react and all i did like i say is called the uh called the fire department and they came down and they were well shoot less than a quarter mile away and then they got there and unfortunately the little girl did not make it and um uh, that uh, was life changing for me and uh, so uh, you know when i uh, joined the volunteer fire department up in new york i uh, left there and joined the largo fire department in uh, florida pinellas county florida and uh, when they said hey we're looking for people to go to the paramedic school my hand was the first one to go up i was i was ready to jump in on that so uh, and I would tell you that being a paramedic is the most rewarding thing of all the careers I've had and everything I've done. Being a paramedic was the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. Um, Can't be. It's not for everyone, though, I would imagine. I mean, you you have to have a special uh, kind of tolerance you know, to do that. I mean, my, my wife, um, when she was working, was a pediatric nurse on an oncology floor. Um, and she would come home at night and I couldn't even hear the stories you know, without just being a wreck, let alone living it and, and, you know, every day. And then thinking of your job as a paramedic, that's even, even more intense constantly. I mean, that, that is, I, just, I think it goes without saying that it's not for everyone. Uh, it's not, you know, and they had a, a saying back in my day that there was paramedic burnout and, and there really was paramedics, you know, see enough bad things happen to enough people and, and it, it can be very life-changing in a bad way for them, you know? So, uh, um, I always just felt like I had the confidence that I, I gave whoever that was, whether it was a, a child or an adult or whatever, I gave them the best chance they, they could have. I felt I knew my skills well enough that, you know, if they, if they were going to survive and many did, you know, um, uh, yeah, I was confident in myself and I, I had peace within myself that I knew I did the best I could do. And, and, and and you know it was in the lord's hand at that point right it sounds like a true calling right that you couldn't have, have predicted that, that would happen and then and then you know something else dropped into your lap that it sounds like you couldn't have predicted but i but i just have to let you know we we have something else in common apparently i'm a, a largo high graduate so oh um, really yes i i'm a i'm a, I'm a proud packer so I'll go okay back okay from, from from quite a few years ago and the school that i went to is no longer uh standing they but um i i as you're talking about i'm trying to do the math on when you would have been a paramedic and hopefully i was never there i on, joined uh, the fire came... department in 73 okay i, I moved okay. to florida in 73 i arrived october 6th of 73 and i was on the job november 1st why why largo of all places how'd you end up? um they were hiring and i was <laughs> i was looking to get hired okay um yeah the amazing thing with that um my first day on the job was uh, November 1st, and if you go back and look, you'll you'll see that uh, uh, Halloween was, uh, there was a tornado that went through, and oh, wow. I had only been in the state of Florida for three weeks, October 6th, November, and um, I show up to, to work, and we go out, and there's houses gone, people killed, cars turned over, and, stuff like that. and I think to myself, what the hell have you gotten yourself into, you know? <laughs> that's right, that's <laughs> right. Stayed for three weeks, and and that's my first day on the job. So, well, welcome to Florida hurricane season for the first exactly. time. But you're actually having to go out in it where everyone else is running from it. That's a that's a big introduction to what Floridians have to have to deal with, right? No doubt, no doubt. Well, so, so how did so then you know from from what what I read, you you had an opportunity to um, you know to to get into the software world a little bit, but you didn't necessarily seek that out either, right? I didn't. Um... Yeah, this was uh, late seventies, early eighties. I, I forget the exact timing of it, but uh, nine one one, as I said earlier, didn't exist back then, and it was coming into the Pinellas County, uh, St. Pete, Clearwater, Largo, um, and there are at the time there were twenty three fire departments in, in that county, all doing their own dispatch and not, you know taking emergency calls and stuff. And uh, the fire chief actually went to my uh, paramedic partner. Uh, who happened to be the union chief and said, who do you know that knows anything about computers? He says, I don't know, but why don't you ask Pete? And he came over and said, what do you know about computers? I said, not a damn thing. And he said, well, are you willing to learn? And I said, sure. So uh, I got involved with the 911 um, installation in Pinellas County. That system 
may still be running. This was early 80s. Uh, that system may be, still be up and running. I heard just recently that they were going to take it out finally. Um, but uh, we ended up growing that business. I quit the fire department, um, ended up growing that business to being the second largest 911 provider. And it's really not the phone call my own, but it's records management and dispatch uh, for police, fire, and EMS. And uh, uh, built that up uh, across the country and up through Canada and uh, ended up selling it to uh, um, Bell Atlantic, who is now at and so, Of course. So. I mean, that is, um, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's an, um, a unique path, right? I mean, and, and, and it, what, one of the things that I found just fascinating since starting this podcast about a year ago now is that um, how unlikely most career paths end up being, where, you know, you, you know you, you, I, I suspect, I always joke being in the staffing industry, no one dresses up as a recruiter for Halloween when they're little. And I'm sure you didn't dress up as a, as a storage professional, right? When, when you were little for Halloween exactly. either. Um, so, 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 we're, so you retired then, you know, air quotes, right? What, 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 what happened next? How, how did you, how did you get into storage? But it sounds like there was something in between. Um, um, no, I, well, yes, no, something in between pods, I guess. But, uh, uh, yeah, I retired. I was age 40 when we sold the, uh, the 901, um, business to, uh, Bell Atlantic and, uh, played golf for two or three years and just got bored. And, uh, and I wanted to do something that I didn't have to have a lot of employees and just something I could go and kick the tires. And there's a, an empty lot. Oh, less than a quarter mile from my house, um, right on the main thoroughfare that uh, I said, I'm going to put a mini storage there. So I got on, you know, I got and did my research back then. Internet wasn't real, real big, but I did my research and, um, and, uh, said, okay, I, I went to the bank and I said, I, I want to build a mini storage over there. And I was looking for a little financing. And they said, what do you know about building? And what do you know about mini storage? I said, not a damn thing. <laughs> no, I, I have to ask you, where was a lot since I'm from, yeah, I grew up there. Where, um, you know, um, it's right in Bel Air. Sure. Um, if you make a left uh, off of uh, uh, Fort Harrison to go down towards the uh, uh, Bel Air Country Club on the right, just before that is Florida Mini Storage. Okay, yep. So I lived inside inside the Bel Air gates, but um, Florida Mini Storage and, uh, you know, built a mini storage and um, it was taking off and that was a pretty popular business back then. It's, it's, they're still popular, you know, and uh, I had two employees, you know, a husband and wife that lived on property and stuff. And and uh, when we opened the, the the business up, you know, we uh, um, actually took one of the uh, shells, one of the units, and turned it into a little office for what became pods. And then so what happened is we, we got the first one built. And the way mini storage works is you, you take like a three mile radius from where the mini storage is going to be built and you capture how many people are in that area. And then you say, okay, if everybody takes six square feet of storage, that's how much storage you can build. But then you got to back out the overlapping competition. Anyway, there's a mathematical formula to, to figure out how big to build. And, and so I, I said, I want to go build a second one. And we started driving around the county. And as you know, Pinellas County is very, very densely populated. And to find a piece of property without, with the right zoning on a major thoroughfare without uh, overlap, too much overlapping competition was very, very difficult. And it's, it's serious, just sitting there said, what if we brought the storage to the house? And uh, that's, that, that was the impetus for pods. And, uh, so, and, and, and the storage business, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, the, the numbers are massive. It was $70 billion. Is that, is that an accurate? Moving storage. Yeah, it really is. And, and I've had you know, to experience it. Uh, I've experienced storage a few times and it seems like it just continues to uh, become more in demand. I see more storage you know, facilities. And recently as my, uh, my you know, a daughter who just graduated from college in the past year, and I have another son in college, so we're constantly moving them in and out of places as, as uh, semesters end. And they have, there's always a delay in between. And it, it's, in, it's, in, it's almost impossible at times to even find storage units, which I, I never would have, you know, as an outsider, I would never have imagined it would, it, it would be so, so in demand, but it really is. It, it, it's crazy. I, uh, uh, when I started to get into the uh, mini storage business, um, my uh, wife's in-laws lived in Flippin, Arkansas, which is where ranger boats are built. But I think it's a population of 1,300. And this is farmland where everybody has basements and barns and all this stuff. And I was driving through there one day and 
in 1300 population, 1300 people um, in the, this community, I think I saw eight mini stores. <laughs> I believe it. Yes, and, I believe it. And, and who, you know, who thinks? And they have basements, and it's not a wealthy community, so they don't have a lot of assets that they have to take care of. And but, but I mean, as Americans, I think we're just you know, we, we like our the, stuff. We, right? we love our stuff. It's hard to say goodbye. <laughs> you know, I, I I wrote something uh, you know, a couple of years ago. I I was. I you know, had this this idea that popped into my head that I needed to. I, I was someone else's story that, that it was a sad story actually. Someone who had a terminal disease and they traveled the world for a year with their children. You know, quit everything, pack, you know, stored everything, and, and traveled the world. And I got this idea in my head, and I was telling my wife, you know, I think our oldest was in eighth grade at the time. So this is ten years ago. I said, we need to do this. Time's gonna pass. We're gonna regret not doing it. And and and. It, and then I was like, I could, we could just give everything up and then, you know, live on a boat and, and just change our life. You know, I just started to build. Then I went, wait a minute. I really like my stuff. I really <laughs> like, I don't want to give up my stuff. I like it. It's comfortable. So mm -hmm. it's hard. It's, 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 it's hard. It's our, it's our culture. It's our nature. So uh, um, people are making a lot of money because of that. <laughs> yeah. So is this, so did, you know, you, when you started pods, you, you saw an idea. Right? Did 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 you know? Did anyone else buy into the idea? Was it was your vision? Did you have trouble convincing others of, of what it would become? Um, no, I did not. And um, you know, a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to build a second mini storage and, and couldn't find the right right lane. And we said, what if we brought the storage to the house? And the internet was just sort of coming out. This was uh, like 95, 96, something around there that we were doing this and. There was nobody really out there doing it at a residential level. There were the big steel cargo containers, shipping containers that, you know, people like a mobile mini were putting at construction sites or behind Kmarts and things like that. But there was nothing really that was um, residentially favorable, right? So, so we said, you know what, what if we built 100 boxes and we brought them to the house and then we got rented a warehouse and said, uh, you know, let's go put these containers in, in the warehouse. And the, the math was real simple, you know, and I, and I went to college for one year. It wasn't for me. So, uh, you know, but I was always good with numbers and, uh, um, and I kid with people. I said, you didn't need to understand MBA, you know, language to, to understand the math. The economics are, we were renting a warehouse for $5 a square foot. We were getting about $15 a square foot for, I think it was maybe $7 we were renting a warehouse for. $15 a square foot for a container and we're stacking them three high. So, you're generating $45 a square foot for what you're paying $7 a square foot. I can do that math, all right? I mean, anybody can get that, that math. And so that was a pretty easy sell. And um, so we built we built 100 containers and we rented a little warehouse and we had to build a contraption to build, uh, pick them up and set them down and things like that. And we, we did that. I had a uh, uh, two of my firefighter buddies, a paramedic that was my partner and, and another guy that was in the same station with us. And... Uh, we started building the first box in his driveway, literally cutting the steel and, and building the first box in his driveway. And uh, my paramedic partner, fortunately, had some construction background, so he sort of engineered the box. And and uh, we built 100 boxes and we started to put them out. And, um, you know, advertising was easy back then. You had you had radio, you had cable TV, uh, satellite wasn't even around, I don't believe. And, you know, the web wasn't really powerful. So, yeah, basically, it's, uh, or yellow pages. So it was, you know, radio, TV, or, or yellow pages. And so we, we decided to do a morning commute ad. And uh, very first ad, and we, were, we knew when it was going to play. So we were all sitting there listening, sitting, huddled around the, in, this, in this mini storage container, huddled around the phone <laughs> and the radio, listening to it. And this ad comes off, and all of a sudden, the phone rings. And we pick it up, and... Tell me more about this. I want to rent one of your containers. The phone rings again. Tell me more about this. Well, we got, I don't know, five, seven, eight calls. More of the calls were, I want to learn more about your business. I want to invest. No kidding. Okay. More than I want to rent your product. Um, so it was fairly intuitive. And I, I tell people, look, right? Um, I tell people that the, what really drove pods is that we opened the uh, uh a new product in Clearwater, Florida, you know, Pinellas County. And we were sort of dropping this product between full service movers and truck rental. I mean, really back then it was really U-Haul and, and Mayflower, you know, that type of thing. Sure. And both of those industries needed some, some shakeup, right? So 
we dropped the we dropped the innovative product between those two. If you didn't have a if you didn't rent a U-Haul and you didn't have a moving service, you know, you either, you had to have a pickup truck. There, there was no other right. solution. So, so it was something that was desperately needed. We we dropped it in Pinellas County, Florida, where there was huge tourism. We're putting these containers in residential neighborhoods, and it's fairly intuitive. When a consumer sees it, they say, Oh, I get that. I right. I mean, I was going to get there eventually that Sorry. <laughs> me and everyone else knows pods because you had a, a walking billboard everywhere you went, right? I mean, that's, no you're like, what is that? Well, it was real clear to see four letters. <laughs> I know what it is. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so the segue into fr franchising, um, we, uh, we started renting containers and stuff. And the next thing you know, somebody up in Largo, where you know that, where that is, Mid-County, uh, had a container in the driveway and they picked up the phone and said, hey, do you mind? I want, I'm moving down to St. Petersburg. Would you mind moving the box down to St. Petersburg? We had never thought of it. You know, we were putting them back in the warehouse. We said, sure, we'll take it down to St. Pete for you. And uh, that happened more and more and more and more. And so we're starting to move people around and people want to move down to Sarasota or move over to Orlando and this and that. And of course, we didn't have the network. I said, we got to grow this thing, you know? And, and, and so... Um, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate that uh, it was intuitive to investors. I raised a lot of money in Tampa Bay uh, to, to get pods off, off the ground. Um, and uh, the intuitiveness um, created people wanting to buy franchises. They came to me and said, I want to buy a franchise. And I literally, I promise you this, I had people lined up outside my door waiting to sign the franchise agreement. I mean, it, it, it had to be. Was there a moment you know, where you... Yeah, once you had the idea, maybe then, you know, maybe once you realized the idea was going to take off, where you you thought, how how did this how does this not already exist? Because that that's the fascinating thing to me about the story is you came up with an original idea, but it it's it's in, I mean it's it's incredibly you know unique and rare to come up with something so logical, so obvious now that there's a need for it. But that no one had ever put it together before. I mean, you, yeah. you, it was your idea that, that it went to invention, went right? I couldn't find a piece of land to build another mini storage. And uh, yeah, that's the mother of invention. And uh, love it, love it. Um, so. Yeah, very fortunate. You know, it was in the right uh, demographics and, and, you know, people on vacation at Clearwater Beach and all this, they see a container in their neighbor's driveway or whatever it is. And, and literally, people would come off of their vacation. And knock on our door and say, "I want to learn more about this business." And and we talk to them about it. And a week later, they uh, they buy a franchise and and open up. You know, any time a new franchise would open up, I'd know that they had started advertising because our phone would start ringing. And Indianapolis is the one that that I remember best. They they opened, and I think twenty minutes after they aired their first commercial, we were having phone calls. I want to buy a franchise. Wow. Now, so you know, to 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 start a business, you know, I started my you know, my my staffing company 17 and a half years ago. And there's there's a you know, this there's no real roadmap for these things, as you know, right? You're kind of on your own. You know, the world doesn't necessarily encourage that. Uh, so you have to just go and do it and learn along the way. Um, and and then I've realized over the years starting business is one thing, right? You have to have a certain you know fortitude to do it and have the right idea and and, and skill and you know work ethic, all those things. And then to have a business succeed for some period of time is another thing, right? Like, and I someday will look back and say, okay, I'm I should be proud of the fact that I could I could do that for a long period of time. But to scale a business, something I haven't achieved, and very, very few achieve, to me, that's an entirely different skill set in some regard. But you stuck with it the whole time. I and mean, how did you how did you make that shift? I mean, why you, right? Because you, there's lots of great ideas. There's very few companies that scale, relatively speaking, right? Most fail. Then there's a lot of small businesses like mine, but you've you scaled it, which just is rare air to say the least. Do you do you have any when you look back and say what made you do that where so many others can't? Right. Well, I mean, again, I I had I had a product that consumers understood where the value was, right, and what value proposition was. We were being pulled. To move our first franchisee was uh, Sarasota. You know, we were being pulled to move to Sarasota, and then we sold Orlando and Fort Lauderdale, and and, and so um, it, it increased our footprint and increased our footprint. What I didn't want ha to happen to me is to ha just have Tampa Bay. I think we had Fort Lauderdale at the same at about that time as well. We opened Fort Lauderdale, but I didn't want to have one or two markets open. 
But I did want to, I recognized I had to have a footprint nationwide in order to create all the lanes and stuff. And so, you know, I, I looked at the, the franchise program as a financing tool. I mean, it really is a financing tool to, to get a footprint and to get the brand established and to create the lanes and things like that. So I did that and that gave credibility to the concept so that when I went out for my second, third, fourth, fifth round of financing, um, I was able to raise enough money and we ended up opening up 10 major markets around the U.S., you know, all the bigger markets, uh, Chicago's and L.A. and New York and Seattle, you know, so we opened up 10 major markets and we opened up 110 franchises wow. uh, throughout the U.S. And then we, uh, then we franchised up into Canada somewhere in the middle of all that. We uh, <laughs> opened up Canada and the, the reason for that is it was actually post 9-11. And, and so the reason we opened Canada was I wanted to figure out if we could get a container that we have no idea what's in it. And there's a padlock on it. The consumer packs something in this box and there's a padlock on it. And I want to take it across the border post 9-11. And we, we figured out how to do that. And customs on both sides worked with us. And we, and we got that working stuff. And, um, you know, we were moving people from Toronto to Florida, wherever it was, and vice versa and stuff. So that, that really grew us. And then um, the next step was, you know, and I was envisioning opening up all around the globe, right? Okay. And, and so if you're in Italy and you see an antique set or your whatever that you, you, you want to buy or whatever it is, something large, and you want to buy it and ship it back, you just order a pod in Italy and say, ship it to Largo and sure. it shows up there, right? That was sort of the vision and it still can be the vision. Um, but um uh, the pro next problem was, okay, I, I can cross the borders. How do I get my container across the ocean? And right. so we opened up Australia. And when I sold the business, we had all of Australia up and running. And I did that for two reasons. One, it would educate us how to ship across the ocean, you know, and that's halfway around the world. But the other half of it was is that segment of the business failed. Nobody would ever know because it was all the way halfway around the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can shut it back down and say, okay, I, we don't know how to do that one. But uh, as it turns out, um, we were able to open Australia. We actually opened a call center there. The, the plan was we had a call center in Clearwater, one in Dallas, one in Australia. And I figured I'd do one over in, you know, the UK or whatever. And as the sun went, so would the call centers, you know, open and close. And they sure. were all active and stuff. That all comes from my software background, right? I, uh, yeah. I, I had those that background if you think about what what portable storage and moving is it's a lot of logistics absolutely um fire police and fire and ambulance dispatch is a lot of logistics getting the right piece of equipment going to the right place so you know the pieces you know just sort of fell into place and the franchisees helped me grow it and well you're, you're making it sound you know simple right you're making it sound like it was just oh you know right idea and, and and it's so much more than that i know that because it's like i said it's something i've chased and not achieved and had great i think i've had lots of great ideas over time but i haven't been able to execute at that level and i've seen many others in the same boat and it did you you know, did you did you you had to learn as you go right like you're saying you had to try something and then assess how it worked did you were you reaching out to experts and, and you mentioned logistics. Now I happen to know is a pretty big logistics company uh, in Clearwater uh, Tech Data Corporation, you know, in your backyard. Did you tap into folks from there? Cause they had a you know, very large global distribution arm. Um, you know, or did you just do it with your own team and build it? Cause those are very different paths. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've got a couple of things and, and the first one is, uh, you know, we all have these great ideas that come along and, and we, you know, the, and we have tons of ideas that come along for making money in businesses and things like that. And the challenge I think we have as individuals is number one, you have to pick out the right idea and, and from all the other garbage out there, which one is really the home run. Right. And that's number one. And number two, you've got to have the guts to go for it. Right. And, and chase it and stuff. The other one I have is I surround myself with people smarter than me. If, sure. if my staff isn't smarter than me in their perspective areas, why do I need them? If I know I, if I know the answer and they don't, why do why do I need them? So I surround myself with a lot of high skilled talent. One of which was a, a gentleman that was uh, logistics. He came from 
Oh, over in Orlando, it's a, I can't think of the name of it. I'll think of it, but it was a, it's a distribution company and stuff. And wasn't Chap, was it? I'm sorry, Chap, was it Chap? No, no, but I had talked to those guys. Um, but anyway, you know, you, there's a lot of pe smart people out there that can help you build a business, and you know, you can't hire them all out of the gate because you'll go broke, just, broke just paying, you know, salaries and stuff. But as as you as you're growing and you're, and you're expanding and you're taking on newer and bigger challenges, hire the right people to help you walk through that, navigate through that, right? All right, so I'm, I'm gonna take advantage of having you here right now. So so apologies in advance for this next question, but um, you know, I've recently started my second business, which is Zengig, which is which is why we're on this podcast today. And I believe it's a, it's, it's a potential home run. You know, I, I believe it as sure as I'm sitting here. But in order to achieve that, I have to sacrifice a lot. And, and um, you know, I have to take a huge risk, huge risk. Worth it or play it safe? You know, how do you, how do you balance that out where, you know, because, look, I'm 52. Taking a risk now is putting, it's not just me. When I started my first business, I, I, I remember having the conscious thought, hey, I'd do this for a year after I quit my job. If it doesn't work, I'm back to working for the man in the same place I am, right? My, I didn't have as far to fall. I have a lot farther to fall now, but I know a lot more. And the idea is you know, it infinitely, you know, um, it's something that I wake up every day thinking about and go to bed thinking about. But how do you mitigate that risk when when you think, you know, how do you how do you how do you weigh that out? Did you ever have to face that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I sold that software business and I did okay. I mean, it wasn't it was a home run for me at my you know, firefighter. Now, able to retire at age 40, right? So yes. it, was, it was a home run for me. Uh, I wasn't Bill Gates, um, you know, but uh, I put all that at risk when I started pods. Sure. I, mean, I, I put it all at risk. And, you did, uh, okay. I was younger. I was 40, right? And um, uh, still, and, you, I assume you would, you would, you know, your lifestyle was one you didn't want to go backwards to a firefighter lifestyle at that point, I, I would assume, right? right? No doubt. So, no so doubt. that's, <laughs> that's to you uh, a lot it, to lose. Uh, it's, that having the guts to go for it yeah is it no really that simple right I mean, idea. and you sound very convinced that you have the right idea and it's a home run you just have to have that fortitude to, to keep plugging along and move it move the ball up the hill yeah and that, that's a you know i think so many people probably don't take that step in the first place for that very reason as i was sort of alluding to earlier i personally don't think the world really encourage you to, you to quit your job and to go take a risk, you know, and I remember when I first did that, I was in a good spot working for a large company, um, ironically, a spinoff of AT&T. So I come from that world too. I sold enterprise call center solutions and I made lots of money and life was good. And I, and I had, I just had this idea that didn't go away for 10 years. And I thought, if not now, when, and, and I remember telling my wife, you may appreciate this. She was pregnant with her third child at the time. I said, I think I'm, I think I'm finally going to do it. And she's like, well, just don't be stressed when the baby comes. And that's been a running joke for 18 years now, because I'm like, I'm going to be stressed no matter what when the, my right, third child right, is right. born. So I may as well uh, be stressed on you know, putting fate in my own hands. But, you know, it's a different, it's, it's, you know, it gets different each time, I think. Um, you know what? It's not that different, right? I mean, you, you rolled the dice and you put a lot of your net worth and your career and your future and your family and all that. Um, but you were convinced it was the right thing. And that's what I said. That's where I started. I said, make sure it's the right one. We all have great ideas. I, I got another 50 ideas out there. I bet you do. I'm not going to chase any of them. Okay. Uh, but this one, this Red Rover, I couldn't let it go. Yeah. So let's, so, so let's talk about that. So you, you, you sold pods for more money. I mean, what, what I have to ask that. So before we get in Red Rover, what's the first thing you did? You know, what, what, what did you had to do something crazy? I mean, you, you know, yeah. you, the, the, the number, you know, it's public, right? You don't mind if I say it, do you? No, I don't mind. You know, for four, $430 million is what pod sold for. Right. Um, now, I didn't put all that in my pocket. Let's you didn't get, of course. I investors, right? But I did okay. Let's say you did okay. <laughs> Let's say you did okay from that deal. What'd you do first? What'd you do after that? You know, I was already living a pretty nice life. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm a pilot. <laughs> Um, I f fly around in private planes. I did back then. I do now. Um, and, uh, you know, I had uh, a nice house on the beach here and I have a, had a nice house in the mountains. And, Got it. Okay. and so and I travel wherever I wanted to travel. So it wasn't that life shattering, you know, or altering for me. It's uh, it was 
it just afforded me the luxury to continue doing what I was doing, right? And, and I knew I could do that for the rest of my life and, and live a, a nice life. So, um, but going into it, as I say, I put everything I had on this, on pods and on that sure. game, right? And, uh, um, yeah, so I had a lot of sleepless nights and uh, I didn't have any babies to cry in that I had to worry about, but uh, <laughs> I had a lot of sleepless nights. And, you know, I, I, amazingly, I would shoot a text or back then it was Blackberry, I guess. Uh, I'd shoot something out to somebody three o'clock in the morning just because it was on my mind. And I figured they'd read it when I get up. My staff was the same way. They were emailing me back. And before you know, we were all up just chatting and stuff like that. I mean, uh, people- let me, let me ask you about that a little bit. It, 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 that you know, I, I was listening to a podcast um, a couple of weeks ago and the guy who did it was invited uh, by Elon Musk to go out and interview him. And this is a guy who came from, you know, he lives in Florida, he flew out to California. And the first night he got there, Elon had to cancel, you know, too busy. And then so he went back the next day. And the way he told the story is that he was waiting for hours and hours. I don't know what time the interview was supposed to begin, but he didn't get to get into Elon's office until 2 a.m. Wow. And as I'm hearing the story, and Elon's you know, work ethic is, is, is legendary from everything I hear. And it kind of takes that, doesn't it? I mean, you know, where... And it's a it's interesting because as you build a business, you know, you have to do that, and you don't think about it. it. Doesn't feel like work. It's not a thought. You just you just do it. And and I tell everyone, freelancing has becomes um, very commonplace now, and it's and it's growing. And I'm a big fan of the the freelance uh, market and and working that way. But it takes a special. You you have to be disciplined and have the right work ethic. It is not for everyone. But how did you find? others to do that with you because you know that that's a that's a hard thing i mean it's, it's one thing for you to do it but to get others to do it too is it's a whole different you know, deal i think it's contagious I, if you set the example and you set the culture and you set the expectations and stuff and you reward those the you know that help you get to where you need to get and um but i think i really do think it's contagious you think that's harder to come by today than it was when you were building pods because i I do. And, and, you know, just somewhat incidentally, one of the reasons I started, um, you know, thought Zengig was needed is because I think there's, we've almost gone too far culturally with not realizing that success is a product of hard work. Success is a product of risk and effort over time. And that's why a story like yours to me is so meaningful. You, you didn't start off at the top. You had to climb the mountain and no one was going to do it for you, but um, you know, gener- there's been generational and societal changes that make that work ethic not, you know, collectively not what it used to be, right? And, and I, totally I'm sure you, you know that too. So today it seems hard. I mean, do you think you'd have that? You, do you do you see that now with 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 Red Rover? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I have a very very sound team. Uh, you know, I was fortunate. I I, uh, I live in Orlando now. I commute to Tampa, and oh, you I do nice. to Tampa. Um, okay. start the business because I had success here and I knew I had some investors that would want to invest in this, but I also knew I had a huge employee base here that I still had relationships with and a reputation with and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, they, uh, um, in today's society, my, my senior team is sort of the old school and they okay. know they have to put in the sweat and things like that. Um, but with you know, working from home and COVID and uh, meetings like we're having right now, right? Uh, tele- telecommunications and stuff. The people are remote and I, and I don't care what you say. If somebody's working from home and the baby's crying, the customer that they were supposed to be talking to just took a second seat, right? They got up and they went to, and take care of the baby. And, and, and so it takes a certain discipline to, to be able to do this. And, and then I think uh, we've empowered the employees to say, okay, well, I don't, I'm having a bad day today. I'm going to start looking and they get on some website and I'll say, oh, here's two jobs. Let me put a throw and I'll just throw a hand grenade in and see if I can get a job with one of these guys. And they're offered $20 more or whatever it is. And, and they, they bail on you. There's no loyalty back, you know, back in my parents' day, um, you know, you got a gold watch because you put 30 years in a business and you gave your heart and soul to that business and you were rewarded with a golden watch and you took a lot of pride in being with the same company for that long, right? And and the employers, you know, took the pride in saying, my employees stick with me. They, you know, we, we treat them well and stuff. You don't have that today, to your point. You just don't have that today. You know, people jump from job to job to job to job. And a lot yeah, of times just, 
stepping stones, right? I just did a did a podcast. Actually, we we put up a, a blog on the website um, just a couple of days ago about is that a bad is it a red flag? Um, and I it was on my mind because I saw one of the job boards, one of the big job sites, you know, who of course are only paid when 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 there's vacancies, right? So right, right, they're, exactly. they're going to have to say no. It's not a red flag. And after you know two decades in staffing and placing thousands and thousands of of employees and working with hundreds of hiring managers, I can tell you without exception, it is a red flag. Yeah, exactly. I, I've never had a hiring manager, you know, uh, say, Hey, I, I, I like resumes where there's no longevity. <laughs> never, <laughs> that has never been a thing. And so, you know, the, what we're trying to do with Zengig and, and again, why, why a story like yours is, is so important because we have to you know, share not what young professionals want to hear, but what I believe they need to hear which is success doesn't happen overnight and you're going to have bad days and you, you grow and improve by dealing with adversity, not by running from it. And it is so easy. You just, like you said, you, you, you click 10 times on, um, on a website and you apply to 10 jobs. And we know that there's lots of jobs out there and, and, and that's, that's easy to do. But I think, um, I, I think it doesn't serve the individuals well. And that's my concern with it, you know, cause they'll say, look, the employers aren't loyal either. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's that simple, right? I think, I think businesses have to make decisions, but there's individuals that are extremely loyal and it is personal to them um, as managers and directors and even executives and owners. Um, but I think that's been blurred, you know, because of um, just bad information that's out there and, and the easy answer, right? I mean, that's, that's right. kind of how I think of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, as one of these employees that jumps from job to job to job, you never see anything through. Do you, how do you ever get a sense of accomplishment? How do you, uh, contribution, you know, I mean, you, you've, you, you worked here for two years and you did a little something, but you'll never be remembered or recognized. And I don't know how you feel good about yourself. If, if, if you don't see something through or, or commit yourself to a, to a project. So it's, it's a different culture today. It is a different culture. So now you're, but you're back in the fray. You chose to do this. And and you know you said you, you didn't want to do it. They made you do it, right? They, well, they made me do it. They didn't. It's not my fault. <laughs> right. they, um, they wouldn't. They wouldn't listen. And so, was there a moment where you said, had to kind of sit back and say, oh, "Okay," because you you know what you're committing to, right? When you when you decide to take this step, it it's not an insignificant decision in terms of commitment and effort. And I'm sure at this point in your life, if you're going to put your name on it with your reputation and history. You're going to make sure it works, and that's a huge commitment. What 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 was the ultimate catalyst for you? Said kind of said you just couldn't let it go. Was that it? Yeah, you know you can only play so much golf, and you can only do so much fishing or flying or whatever it is. And and uh, you know the more I thought about it, and the more people I talked to about it, I was just convinced. Right, I I was convinced it's the right thing. Um, as I said earlier, um, we Pods is a great company, and we did a lot of things right, but you know. Times have changed. Um, our culture is changing every day. Um, COVID comes along, and people are working from home, and people want to take on. Well, you know, technology has empowered us to take on more ourselves and stuff. People don't want to talk to people on a call center. They want to just do something on the phone. So, you know, all of those things, you know, that we did at, at Pods that we could have done better or can be do done better today because our lifestyles have changed is sort of what we've rolled into this role, Red Rover. You know, we, we empower the consumer to just get on their phone, type in a, a, an order, drive up to a, a lot, get into access the gate, get in the truck, drive the truck home, literally push one button and the container comes off the truck, releases itself in the truck, comes off the truck, puts itself in your driveway, and then puts it back and you bring us the truck back. We didn't charge you for the truck. You got the container at your time, on your schedule, at your convenience, put it exactly where you want it, and um, it didn't cost you a dime. You know, with, with pods, that's a three to $500 series of events to, to have the deliveries and the pickups and stuff. Ours is for free, but you're doing the driving. And, and um, but at your convenience, at, at your, your, your choosing, which yeah. is, I mean, it did, it, I mean, again, just like when you described your, your, your idea for pods, it sounds so logical. And and yeah, you presented it to the people who had the opportunity. You were already you know halfway there, right? Um, right, right and, and chose right. not to do it. What? Um, why do you think no one's thought of that before? I mean, is it you know? There's you know other, it's a big industry um, now. 
I do think there's people that just sort of plug away and, and do their assignments and things like that. And then there's people, no pun, no pun intended, that think outside the box, right? <laughs> and um, uh, I'm one of those guys that I just, anything I look at, I think, how can I do that better? And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the delivery side of uh, Pod's business, back when I owned it, and I can sort of confirm this with the, the CFO at, at their 20th anniversary, that I did a little speech the 20th anniversary and they don't pods doesn't make any money on the delivery side of the business i mean they make it here but they lose it there it's more of a break even huge headache sure. the drivers show up late they put the container in the wrong place they crack the driveway they run over the mailbox all of these things and people the right say, they're relying on individuals at, at that point right, right. And, and so staffing guy I mean, I get it, it. it happens it happens and the, you know then the consumer's paying three to five hundred dollars I just took all that away and said, listen, I'm not going to charge you. Here's the truck. Come get it. It's sort of a blend of U-Haul and pods, right? It's sure. a truck you drive with a portable container on it. And we, we engineered, we have two styles of trucks. One's got an electric ramp that goes around and lets you lower the ramp in front of the door anywhere around the side of the container. And the other one literally picks the container up and sets it in the driveway and you bring us the truck back and it's there for as long as you want. And when you want to pick it up and bring it back to us or, or you're done with it, you get the truck again, you back up to it and you push a button and it picks it up and brings it back. Nobody else in the world can do that. Okay. And I think that's what Americans and especially the, you know, the, the millennials and stuff, that's what they want today. They just it's a better it. way. I mean, it's, it's efficient. It's clean. It's, it's quick. I mean, these are, you know, technology is is given us you know convenience and comfort, and that's what you've delivered with a solution that you know, I just know. When anytime you're 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 dealing with drivers and and moving things, you know, convenience and comfort is not what comes to mind, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, and absolutely. and you just you just solved all of that, which is yeah. And the nice thing from my perspective is, if you run over your mailbox, I say, geez, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you didn't hurt my truck, rather than <laughs> oh, I've got to come out and fix your mailbox, right? Um, it, it's just it's just a complete game changer. Um, you know, we actually are offering a full spectrum now. We'll 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 drive the truck. You know, there's people that are intimidated by it, but they're smaller than U-Haul trucks. So I don't know why we have backup cameras and lane departure and emergency braking and all these things in these trucks. You know, they're all brand new, but people don't want to drive. So we'll do the delivery. So you can go from doing the entire process of coming and getting a truck, taking it home, loading the container up bringing the container back to us and, and, you know, it goes into storage and you can do the entire thing, or you can go to the other, other end of the spectrum and say, I don't want to touch a thing. I want you guys to come do it. And we'll have a truck delivered to you with a crew to pack your stuff, wrap your dishes, all this stuff, load the container and put it back. So anywhere in between, if you want to do all of it, but the heavy stuff, you know, you're the complete do it yourself or, but you can't lift up the, the gun safe, you know, or whatever it is, the, where all your money's at and you're in your safe. Um, you know, so you can say, come and I want you guys to come and just do the six heavy items for me. We'll do that. We'll send out a crew when you're ready for us and we'll just do the six heavy items for you. So nobody else offers that full spectrum and nobody else has a truck that the consumer can drive and offload a 10,000 pound container in the driveway. It, 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 and again, it just makes sense <laughs> as you're talking, you think. It's not a hard sell. Well, no. the consumer understands it, right? And now, are you going through the same model then? Are you going franchise model again? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Okay. You know, uh, we're, we've already opened up 15 markets. Uh, I've got a great partner in uh, Oppenheimer out of New York, um, financial um, institution out of New York. Uh, I've got a great partner with them. Uh, I raised a lot more money than I raised the pod. So we've got 15 markets open, but to open the entire U.S. or maybe Canada and things like that on balance sheet is a massive, massive oh. requirement. So I have people that call me every day, say, I want to invest in your company. I want to invest. I, well, the way you can invest in my company is you buy a franchise. Sure. Yeah. Right. And um, you, you, uh, you build your market and you, you know, you capture some of the long distance. It helps the brand. It helps all the other stores that are open. Um, when we exit, when we have an event or something, um, you can tag along with us and, and get a 70% uh, of our multiple, you know, on exit, which is a better multiple than you'll get any other time. And, you know, that's how pods has grown since I sold the business. So we had buybacks and, and roll up causes in the franchise agreements. 
and they've been buying back those 110 franchises that were out there and now it's 99 percent company owned you know, oh is it really company. interesting i didn't know that yeah, okay. yeah. How, many, how many franchise uh, do you have do you have so far how many franchisees we we don't have any we just started franchising in january we're you in uh, okay. contract negotiations for um uh three markets out west uh we have a couple uh we're not in negotiations yet but we have people looking at things like entire states or multi markets um you know large area developers type things um i'm convinced you know the first one's always the hardest right the first franchise is the hardest sure i'm convinced once we get a little momentum on our belt that i'll have people waiting outside my door and our network will build and the value and the brand will build and um you know i'm gonna be knocking on pod store and i i went into this business and when i wanted to pitch it to podge pods i i was thinking to myself you know this is really a business that will go after you all if sure. I'm giving you the truck for free Absolutely. and you all is the alternative and you got to pay for the truck and then take it to the mini storage and unload it, I'm giving you the truck for free. I'm thinking this is a huge opportunity for somebody to grab this and, and, and really shake up the, the U-Haul side. I think we'll get a lot of pods customers because it's, it's a cheaper solution and you don't pay for the delivery and things like that. And it's a convenient solution, but you know, we dropped, I dropped pods between the, full service movers and and truck rentals i've dropped red rover between pods or all affordable storage companies and the truck rental so company. smart it's so smart how, how many do you have a sense for how many utah u-haul trucks there are out there i haven't got a clue i mean it has um you know we're gonna have a ton of them um but uh you know times have changed i think we've introduced a new product uh um at the right time you know the housing market was was at a peak when we started you know started the business and stuff and it slowed down but we don't see ourselves slowing down and uh um you know we're going into moving season that's uh april may to september you know type time frame we're going into moving season we've got over a thousand lanes between our markets now and as people come on duty or on duty on, online we'll we'll have more lanes and and so it's uh it is so it's so exciting. Now I have to I'll put you on the spot for the second time since I have you live and I'm recording this. Will you come? Can I have you? Can I interview again in a year and and, and get an update on on Absolutely. where you are? Love to do it. Love to do it. Because now I'm invested in this fully, and and uh, <laughs> now that I know I even put franchise, on, then you're fully invested. Well, I, I you know I, yeah, well invest in. Can I can I put you on the spot and you invest in Zengig and I'll. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, it. Uh, well, that's the last question I'll ask you from a franchisee standpoint. You know, I, I, I don't know, truth be told, a whole lot about, about franchises, but how much experience and knowledge do you have to have in order to you know, uh, set yourself up for success as a franchise? It can't, it can't be as simple as just writing a check. Um, it's not that simple, but we do a large majority of it. The call center, all the calls come into our facility. So we do all that. We do all of your logistics for you, um, all your scheduling. Um, we do all your uh, collections. Uh, you, you keep your own balance sheet and P&L, um, you know, but that's all on QuickBooks and it's all set up of charter accounts and everything's all set up for you. So, oh, um, you know, we, we had 110 franchisees at Pods and we didn't have a single failure. Every one of them walked away multimillionaires, okay? Wow. Wow. Um, I believe that the best franchise programs and the most successful franchise programs are those that are, are fair to both sides. Yes. You know, there's a lot of give and take in the franchise world. And, and you, if you're going to be a franchisee, you need to understand that there's a way and a methodology to do things. And we're going to teach you what that is. If you want to be an entrepreneur and go off and do everything your own yourself, then that's great, you know, go off and be an entrepreneur. But if you're buying a franchise, just recognize that there are processes and procedures and, and rules around how you grow. Um, but, you know, as long as core philosophy, right? As long as it's fair for both sides, we both win. Well, and, and, it, and it, you know, I, I, don't, I've, I don't have perspective of being a franchisee, but I do have perspective of being a, a, an entrepreneur who didn't think about all of the other things that, that come along with, running the business that I, you, you mentioned QuickBooks, just something as simple as that and setting up a chart of accounts. I knew how to sell staffing and I thought I could do this. I was confident enough to do that. I, I, I never opened QuickBooks before. I didn't know how to you know, establish it, but all of those things are necessary. It's not as simple as 
the surface level idea or thing that an individual has experience and knowledge to execute, it is so complex. And so I've always from afar admired the franchise model because it, once again, it just, it just makes sense that you get to combine the best of, of multiple, um, you know, ideas and, and areas of expertise, which sounds like has been your, your specialty all along. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is a powerful tool. Franchising is a powerful tool. You get the, the advantage of somebody with local knowledge in Podunk, Nebraska, wherever it is. Okay. They have local knowledge of that market. They have friends that they can leverage and, and they can find the warehouse and they can have people that they can put to work that they can trust and stuff. So their, their job is to manage the operations and, and, um, and the PR with the local consumer and, and do some guerrilla marketing and, and those types of things, which as somebody living in Florida is going to have a hard time having those connections and making that. So it's really, yeah. it's really um, easier for a local to open up in a, a market that is for somebody to just come walking in and, and you know, take over. So um, it's a, uh, it's a fun business. It's uh, a lot of growth left, you know, and uh, pods has been around almost 25 years. I think, don't hold me to this because I don't have that, that good of intel anymore, but I think they'll do almost two billion in revenue this year. Oh, and um, you know, with, a, uh, you must 30, be so 30, proud. I mean, 30, just forty percent margins, and then you put a ten or twelve multiple on that. You know, they're a multi-billion-dollar company today. That's amazing. I mean, really, it's 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 so great to um, you know to be able to to spend time with you and 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 hear your story, especially since you committed to you know letting me spend another hour with you you know later on. So yeah, I'll, no I'll take advantage of that, and we'll put this in our show notes. But just so so anyone who's listening can know how how to inquire about becoming a franchisee, where 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 do they go? Well, they can go to our website, um, you know, uh, redroversplural.com. Um, and they can call uh, our 833-733-7300. Um, and we'll put that in our show notes. So no one has to remember that. Write that down. We'll have it for you. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Well, well, Pete Warhurst, thank you so much. I mean, this has been, like I said, an absolute pleasure. And, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed doing it with you. Wonderful. And everyone, thanks for, for listening and drive safe.